This is Bowie Fernandez. You watching PhilippineNews.com. All right, we all settled. Okay. So this is this is actually much like you'll see. We do this whenever we go into a neighborhood, and we've gone into many. In fact, we just went into one of the Portola district, which goes over just over San Bruno Mountain into to Daly City um, for tests that we're doing here in the next uh, few weeks. Um, we actually just passed two of these tests, one in San Rafael and one in Modesto yesterday. And when we go in, uh, we'll do it. What we call a community open house, and we usually hold them at a uh, library or school or place some place of public assembly in the neighborhood before we go in and do all this work. So as you can imagine, this is a, our pipelines aren't clear plastic filled with blue fluid. Um, but this is really just a model uh, made to demonstrate how we actually test the pipelines. First off, can anybody anybody tell me why you think we test these pipelines with water? You know. So it doesn't explode? Not you PG&E guys, I mean, you, know? <laughs> you have inside knowledge. Uh, it just makes sense. Who's, uh, I see some demographic that, that, that can relate to me here, though. Who saw the movie Jaws? Jaws. Right, right? Into the movie, what happens? The guy shoot the first Jaws. The guy shoots a scuba tank, which is filled with compressed air, mind you, or a compressed gas, and the shark blows the smithereens, right? Great ending to a movie, not a great ending to a pipeline, okay? What causes, it causes that shark to die is the energy from the compressed air or compressed gas inside the tank expands. We don't want that to happen if a pipeline breaks when we test it. And the reason we test with water is it's basically non-compressible. It's a solid medium. So if we test that pipeline and it pops, it's not going to blow up. It's not going to blow a hole on the ground. It's just going to go bink and water's going to drip out wherever it flows in gravity. So if it's on a downhill side where the leak happened, the water will go out downhill and it's usually underground. So it doesn't cause any great bit of damage and it's fairly easy to leak detectable. That's why we use water. But there's a few problems with that, right? When we turn on our stove or our, our heater goes on, we also don't want water squirting out after we've done one of these tests. So what we really have to do first is and that's what this is made to, to duplicate, is dig up the pipeline that we're going to test on either end and isolate it. So the first thing that happens is we have to take the gas out of it. And we do what we call venting, or in the industry a lot of folks call it a blowdown, and we blow the gas out of the pipeline into the air. Right? So you guys know what happens when you smell gas, particularly if it's around San Bruno or anywhere on the peninsula for that matter. It, it, it could be really upsetting. So we've taken great pains to develop a whole program that notifies people by phone, with their community meetings, anybody around the vicinity by letter to notifies our call center. If you smell gas during one of these things, when you vent the line to take it out of service, that it's not an issue. We monitor that very closely. <coughs> we actually do, do cloud modeling so we know what way the gas is going to go. And it disperses fairly rapidly. It's a very common thing, and it's not harmful, but you would smell it. And we tell people when you smell gas, you want to call so we take the gas out, okay, and before we can fill it with water, one of the things we have to do is clean it out because many of these were, were manufactured and installed years ago, and you might have had some welder welding on the pipeline that threw his glove in it, or uh, a piece of welding rod, or a piece of wood that was used to hold the pipeline up when they were putting it in the, in the ditch. <coughs> We can't have that in because we actually have to push all that air out of the pipeline to make it safe. So we'll use what we call a pig, and you'll hear why we call it a pig in a, in a little bit, Do it, but to clean the pipeline. So we'll run one of these up and down the pipeline several times, maybe more, to get any debris or contaminants out of the pipeline before we introduce water into it. We also want to introduce water into it so it's nice and clean when we dispose of it because we dispose of the water in the sewers. Here, you guys want to pass it? I'll toss this to somebody to see that. It's actually for our big pipelines. They're actually that big around. They're big, big, this big around. And this would be what we call a cleaning tank. Here, catch it and pass it around. So we'll, we'll clean it with one, and then we'll introduce water into it. 
And this is a pig in the front end, and it's called a watering pig. And this is one one actually looks like that we put into the pipeline. They're, they're, they're as big in diameter as a pipeline. So if it's a 36 inch pipeline, this pig's about as long as this table and about that big around. And we'll use it to push all the air out of the pipeline. So I'll do my, I'll do my pipeline guy aerobics here and toss this to you. You look like you caught the first one, so you're two for two. Um, and we'll push the, push the air out of the pipeline. You'll notice if you can see the gauge up here, it's kind of bouncy, right? The reason it's bouncy is because of the air. The air is compressing. It's kind of squishy, right? When we get to all water, that gauge is going to get solid, okay? And I'm going to get it close to the end here because I'm going to tell you how we do this testing. All of our pipelines run at a, a fixed pressure not to exceed. Okay, so we call that the maximum allowable operating pressure in a pipeline. Okay, when we test it with water, we test it to 1.6 or 160% of what that maximum allowable operating pressure with gas in it would be. So, for example, if it says, if our pressure on this pipeline was going to be 10 pounds, we would test it to 160 pounds. So we'll get to the end here and I'll show you how that works. So we'll be, we got to be, see how it kind of spikes here real quick at the end. Let's see if it gets really solid and we should be at about, if we're going to run this at 10 pounds, we'll say it's 160. It's at 16 now. Okay, it's kind of hard to see from there. These gauges aren't too big. And what we'll do is, we'll, the, for the first half hour of the test, any pipeline that's going to catastrophically fail or break or pop, like I said, you know, pop, it's going to happen in the first half hour of the test. In fact, all that have failed during the test where it actually pops can happen within, a, within less than 20 minutes. So we actually do what we call a spike test at 160% of the pressure that that pipeline would ever see for the first half hour and hold it. So we know if that thing's going to break, it's going to break in that first half hour. Then we go to what we call a leak portion of our test. And We'll hold the, re that, the remaining pressure for another seven and a half hours for 150% of the maximum operating pressure of the pipeline. And we'll hold that and you guys, I, I won't make you guys wait eight hours because I know lunch is out. <laughs> but we'll hold that and the reason we do that for eight hours is if there was a little tiny leak in that pipeline, you're, it's not going to pop catastrophically. Pressure's not going to drop. It'll actually gradually drop. And in the real world where this is dug up on either end, it's not quite this simple. We have a big trailer that we park with a computer system that's hooked up where we monitor the temperature of the pipeline and the pressure. And we monitor it at microsecond intervals to detect any change. If there's a change in temperature, you're going to see a change in pressure. If the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up incrementally and therefore goes down the pressure goes down incrementally. So if the, the pressure started going down and we didn't have a correlative temperature decrease, alarms go off everywhere and we shut the test down and we have to go look for a leak <coughs> in that seven and a half hour period. Okay? Um, we had one of those occur last year just outside of Stanford on the main thoroughfare under the cement. Um, and there were sprinkler systems so there's no obvious water leaking. And we looked for it for a while, and we actually had to take all of the water out of the pipeline. We had to introduce helium into the pipeline. And the reason we use helium is because it's the smallest gas molecule. It'll actually penetrate up through the asphalt and cement. You wonder why those, you know the rubber balloon <coughs> always go flat after a day or two? It's because helium molecules are so, are so small, they actually penetrate through the rubber, latex rubber where those mylar balloons, they'll stay up forever. That's why you buy those, you know, for your wife, so you can make sure that she keeps them forever. Um, so we use helium, right? And we use a helium detection system to go up and down the pipeline. We're able to find, narrow the leak down, probably to an area about as wide as these seats, and we're able to listen and locate the leak. Uh, with acoustics, we put with these things called geophones, which is an acoustical probe into the ground, to listen to where we can see hear the gas running out of the pipeline. And we were able to find it was about nine-tenths of a millimeter hole in the very bottom of the pipeline. And that leak actually occurred when we were doing that ramp test. We actually caused the pipeline to leak with the test. When we got it up to pressure, it popped a little hole out of the corrosion pit in the bottom of the pipe that we were repairing. So I'm not going to make you guys wait the full 
eight hours for this test to be complete. So at the end of the test, we'll back off the pressure and we dewater the pipeline. And typically we, we, we uh, dewater, if we're out in an agricultural area, sometimes we'll go work with an irrigation district to put it in their field. In the cities, it usually goes to the city sewer system. And we'll work with them to see what best time is to introduce a bunch of water into their system. Uh, usually they like when we discharge at night. In the real world, this is one of those big baker tanks that you might see, or a rain ferment blue thing that you sit out that we put the water into and pump it in and out of with big pumps. And we don't really do it with a hand pump out there in the field, they're big. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd, I'd be much more fit than I am. <laughs> so, when we dewater the pipeline, we'll actually push it out with a pit. So you'll see as this gets to the end, it'll just move it all right back out at the end of the test. You hear that squealing? So the real pipeline, these things actually sound like a pig squealing in the pipeline. Wee, 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 wee. Everybody thinks pig stands for pipeline inspecting gauge or some acronym. It's the sound of the, the snake device going through the pipeline. It sounds like a squealing pig. So that's kind of, that's the fun story that I can tell, how it got its name. So we'll, we'll dewater the pipeline and then we'll dry it. So after it pushes all the water out of the pipeline, you go three for three. <laughs> After we get all the water out of the pipeline, then we'll dry it with a big sponge and we'll run a series of what we call drying pigs through the pipeline because we do not want any residual water left in this pipeline. We actually dry them to they're extremely dry and arid. We get it to a negative 20 dew point or better, which is really like beyond desert dry. Um, and we'll sometimes run hot air or put a little bit of methanol through it. It's like the swimmer's ear stuff. Methanol is basically alcohol in the pipeline that takes all the moisture out of the pipeline because we do not want any condensate in our pipeline at all. So that's it, we'll run those back and forth. After the test, we'll bury both ends back up. We put in a, a piece of pipe that we've cut out of each section. Those wells are actually x-rayed before we put the line back into service. We will purge the air out of the line at which time we'd notify the, the surrounding community because you'll get a gas odor at that time too because at the very end as we purge the gas, you'll smell a little bit before we close it in. We want 100% gas in the line, not any oxygen left in the line or air, and put it back into service. The other thing that's really important is, and really one of the complexities of doing this, is maintaining service to our customers, power plants, industry in the Bay Area, because these lines aren't this pretty. They usually have branches coming off them that we have to cut off and isolate so we don't get water down to our customers. And part of that is, is either reconfiguring our system to serve those customers while this piece of pipe is out of service, or moving in temporary LNG, liquefied natural gas, or compressed natural gas trailers in to serve them temporarily while this work's being done. It usually takes anywhere between a month to six weeks to complete one of these tests on a system because of the cleaning involved and the actual construction work. I didn't bring the, the poster board in here, but if you, we, if you go back up this door on the left, there's a picture of the size of one of the excavations and the real size of the pipeline. You can see how big that pipeline is in your handout. Mm -hmm. That's actually a new piece of pipe being tested before it gets put in um, at one of our facilities. And they're this big around. And the holes you have to dig in the, in the earth to work on them are big. It's, it's, these are big transmission pipelines operating at very high pressure. So it's a big intrusive kind of work site when we do that kind of work. Um, that's basically it. We get it dry, we put it back into service, we reconnect the customer lines so we're hooked up to this, this pipeline, and it's all said and done if it passes. Um, last year we did have two failures on, our, on these pipelines. We had one down in Woodside that was right off 280 that made the news, um, that, that was up on a hill, Fortunately, it was actually the high part of the test, so not much water ran out, not all the water ran under the pipe, but some did, enough to go down onto the freeway and wash some dirt onto the freeway. That actually pipe actually failed during the spike portion of the test when we got up to 160 point, we were bringing it up to the ramp pressure, and it was hit at, at one time by a third party doing some excavation. There was a big scar across the top of the pipe that looked like somebody doing some excavation had dented it. The other failure we had was down in Bakersfield, uh, similar situation. It was actually at right up to almost 98% of that ramp pressure at the very, very top that we got, and it broke. So 
both the failures, actually all three of the failures were, failed, would have never failed with gas in them, but they did fail during our test, which is exactly what we want to happen. That's why we want to test them and to find the weaknesses and repair them before they could become a weakness with gas.